Hi everyone, this is Cheryl Parker. I'm the president of the American Nursing Informatics Association. And this afternoon, it is my pleasure to have with me uh, Steph and Dwayne Helscher um, from the Lubbock, Texas area. And hi guys, I hear you're doing some really cool things with clinical decision support. So I'm just gonna throw <laughs> it right over to you and let you share your story. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Parker, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's a great honor to be asked to speak today, and hopefully we can share some valuable information. I know that the previous webinars we've watched that ANIA has been putting out have been tremendously helpful, and uh, we hope others find benefit to it, too. It's definitely nice to have some guidance from those that are ahead of us in the surge that's currently coming across the nation. and. Uh, Dwayne, he's also going to be talking with us today. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started with basically our expertise. We're both informatics nurse specialists and we work in the West Texas area. We're at a large academic center that's a hospital and two ambulatory systems. And we're not that big as far as a health system, but we serve a very large geographical area, about 131,000 square, square miles from El Paso to Albuquerque, all the way over to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We've probably got just over 3 million in population that we serve in our area. So we definitely have um, geographic space and so there's two big health systems in our area. They're kind of rivals, but when this all first started, they actually stepped up together and said, together we're going to work on making sure that the West Texas area stays safe. So that was really nice to see with our big healthcare systems here. But um, as I said, basically our bread and butter is clinical decision support. And a little bit of our history with that started really back in 2014, 2015 with the Ebola outbreak, another Ebola outbreak. But this one was really the one that caught everyone's attention worldwide and especially here in the United States. I think a lot of people take the mental perception that it, it can't happen here or we're so isolated, there's no way that's gonna happen. And Ebola really caught us all off guard. And uh, the big one that everyone's familiar with, of course, is the one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But you can't say anything against that health system for being caught with this because we all were. And especially us in a more rural type setting over in the West Texas area, um, even though Texas is huge geographically, Dallas-Fort Worth is right down the street. <laughs> and so we were, scared and rightfully so and really the big impact that came from this was even though we were all well into our electronic health records being stood up there wasn't really good infectious disease communication within the systems at all yet and you know there were places for travel documentation but it really didn't do anything. And when you have structured data, which is fantastic in electronic health records, but doesn't do very much, it doesn't communicate to anybody, it doesn't really serve a purpose other than holding a piece of data, that's where you get into trouble. So really Ebola came on right before Dwayne and I started taking over the infectious disease process within our system. And we're fortunate, we, we of course have a major vendor at our site, but we have a lot of leeway with custom builds. So that came in really handy. But essentially when Ebola came, they had a very knee jerk reaction. Oh, we've got to get something in there very quickly. And I know it took the vendors a bit of time back then to get things into the system. So ours was more of a custom implementation to where they put something very simple out there, you know, where were you traveling? What was your travel range? They didn't really look at symptomology. They had a lot of um, automation with it that they thought at the time was to be helpful. Like if it fired that this patient's possibly an Ebola patient, we're gonna automatically send an isolation card up. Um, we can talk about that a little bit later, but financially, when we did take over with the Zika timeframe, automated is good, but just because you can doesn't always mean you should. So knock on wood, our location has yet to have an Ebola case. So if you have a automated clinical decision support that's fired 400 times in two years, 
and every single time it fired, a cart got sent up. That's money because nobody used it. You have to go clean it, strip it back down, make sure it's good to go for the next person. So there's a lot of caveats to clinical decision support, especially in this time of pandemic that needs to be thought about. And I always caution just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. So it's good to develop a governance. So basically where we started again was after Ebola. The system had been set up very quickly they had put together something that was workable, um, but not well maintenance. It's kind of once Ebola had faded, everybody went back to their jobs and there wasn't a lot of maintenance or governance set up around it. So it kind of the little rules and alert that went with it went off on its merry way and nobody really looked at it much anymore. When we came on, when Zika started coming around in 2016, 2017, we really wanted to start with what does the system have already? And all it had was this old Ebola rule. And essentially we went and investigated it. It was still firing on say Western Europe and it hadn't been in Western Europe since almost a couple months after Ebola came to the United States. So that needed to be fixed. Um, we had the automated isolation cart issue that our infection prevention and control department found out about and they're like turn that off <laughs> and we're like okay and uh what else no symptomology so essentially it was firing if you had been within the entire continent of africa <laughs> boom alert and we're like Ooh, no <laughs> that contributes to alert fatigue and we're all about not doing that to our clinicians nurses or physicians so we really wanted to concentrate that. So rule number one, rein that in. So we got Ebola all reined in and we talked to our subject matter experts and our individuals that we consider our go-to people, our infectious disease experts. And we really started developing a focus group, somebody that we could come to that could advise us. We started investigating guidelines. Who are the experts here? Of course, in the United States, you're looking at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. Um, on the national global stage, you're looking at the WHO. Um, there's IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America. Hopefully I got the acronym right. They have a lot of stuff with ProMed um, emails and blasts that they send out that's not just people viruses, but it talks about what's running around in animals right now, which of course, they were suspecting that a bat started all this consumption of a bat. And so that's good to know too, that somebody's actually keeping an eye out on the animal aspects of it, not just people. So we really did this preliminary investigation when Zika came about is how can we really turn this into something that we can use for this and use in the future? Because call it a hunch, this isn't the last rodeo. We're not going to just stop with Zika and no other outbreaks of something crazy is not going to happen again. And it kind of seems to be every two years if you're watching the calendar with SARS and MERS and hantavirus and you name it. So we kind of wanted to use something that was going to be a rapid deployment model is what we call it. We wanted to build and design a base unit within the electronic health record that was reusable. You know, customize it as much as you need to, of course, because we still want it to be usable, but we want it to be reusable so you don't have 37 versions of something out there that you've got a maintenance every time a new virus pops up. So essentially with Zika, we kind of took this effort to make something that we could reuse and that was usable for the clinicians. And we did go ahead and get that focus group started. We wanted to make sure that they had input in it because you've got to have the end users and stakeholders engaged. Dwayne and I are clinicians. We're both RNs. We've been doing this for a quarter of a century each. Very familiar with boots on the ground nursing workflow, but we're not there all the time and things change and no one knows it better. <laughs> like the people that are actually doing it every day. And you can guess, oh, Ah, surely they'll like this. This is fantastic. 
And that's kind of like uh, Vanderbilt's example a week ago where they were saying, we said, we made an assumption. We said, this would be fantastic. And the nurse is like, ooh, don't mess with our stuff right now. We don't want it. So it's always best practice to make sure that you get your end users, your clinicians, your people that are going to be impacted involved and let them help you with that. So we made sure that we got that done with the Zika build and brought in um, our infectious prevention and disease department, which nobody had bothered to consult with them. And, you know, who has time when Ebola popped up? Everybody's like, well, turn it on. <laughs> and hopefully we can save lives. So with Zika, we had a little bit more luxury of time. I'd say the other big thing that came in with the Zika build and process, and I'll let Dwayne speak to this too, of course, um, was we started seeing federal agencies like the CDC and the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT. They started popping up trying to be leaders and guiders for us. So we had originally an all hazards work group nationally and uh, Dwayne and I got to participate with that. I even got to testify in Washington, D.C. for best practice on our Zika build, which was yay. That was exciting. And to see what everybody else was doing nationally. And um, again, that's why these webinars hopefully are, are very helpful because you want to see what your neighbors are doing, you know, and there's so many good ideas that have come from other people that we don't think about. So we started participating with CDC and ONC and specifically CDC in the years after that as we came up to coronavirus with their adapting clinical guidelines for the digital age project. And now the ONC and the Health and Human Services has one of their own, which is CRET, which is, Dwayne, remind me, computerized research for emerging technologies, <laughs> something like that. I think, it's, I think it's critical response for emerging, emerging technologies. Yeah, I was way off, <laughs> but <laughs> we've got to get in on a couple of theirs and they're, they're doing a great job too. And they're thinking along the same lines. Their goal is what can they do to help us have standardized guidelines that we can all use across the board that can help us as the boots on the ground informaticists build things faster into the system when something happens like coronavirus and Again, Dwayne can talk to that when now we're talking about fire and uh, APIs and CDS hooks and CDS connect and how that's going to be really the next step of clinical decision support. But uh, I'll finish off this history with basically we had developed new nursing documentation. We had to integrate pregnancy, sexual partner, travel history, all that had to be integrated into Zika. And, um, a good friend of ours, Dr. Floyd Eisenberg from the East Coast, he had wrote a white paper, which I think he's actually still working on and updating with coronavirus. And if it ever comes out, y'all have to read it. But basically, his algorithms were crazy advanced. And it took into consideration everything that was so complex about Zika. So this is where the federal agencies came in and said, it is so complex. How do you translate that to a physician or a nurse? And how do you translate that to an analyst so that they can understand it and educate a physician or nurse on what this algorithm means? This is what we're going to change in the system. So that whole project went into the CDC's Adapting Clinical Guidelines project, and it was impressive how much has to go into clarifying all of those algorithms and all of this evidence-based guidelines that these guys offer and how do we and our vendors translate that and we're all translating independently of each other and so their goal is really to try to standardize that process and hopefully we'll be able to help them out in the next year or two make that happen but um, coronavirus when we got up into that those groups were still there um, and there's the adapting clinical guidelines for the CDC one is still going strong. We're still with that. And with Corona, they've shifted their viewpoint just a little bit to just making computable guidelines for COVID at the moment and uh, putting the other ones kind of in the back pocket until we get through this, which is great. And the CDC's had a rough month, <laughs> I think, with 
who making one recommendation, the CDC making another, um, our government leadership is trying, Dr. Fauci, he's our hero, <laughs> so we like listening to him, he's quite the words of wisdom with medical medicine and science, and we appreciate that, but to translate what we need to be doing, we need those kind of leaders to help us out with this, there's only so much we can figure out on our own. So getting into turning it over to Dwayne for a bit, that all of that that we did in the system, all the build, all the design, all the governance, all the development of a maintenance cycle. So we actually kept everything evidence-based and safe. Then they started requesting other things, like we created one for tuberculosis. We created a MERS one, which actually became our first seasonal clinical decision support because where we live geographically, we really only see an influx of population that might impact us with MERS with the seasonal Saudi Arabian Hajj that they do as a pilgrimage every year. And it moves every two weeks, moves up two weeks, I believe, every year. So it's actually a moving target clinical decision support. So we turn it on a month before and leave it on a month after those two weeks. And so we've done that two years now. And uh, luckily, we haven't caught any, any MERS yet either, but we're ready, hopefully, if we do. So all that led up into coronavirus. And I would say, even though we had like a little bit of real world testing and deployment, this was really our real world test. And um, we were crazy busy with what we really saw it coming in January, of course, and by the time we decided that we were going to flip the switch and put something in there, we basically had something mocked up and functional in a production domain in a couple hours. And then we went ahead and we made sure we had our emergency governance in place, which is usually verbal or emails or walk over and go ask somebody in authority permission. We said we tested it non-prod, we're ready to go. And so we have the very basics in production. And then we waited till the next morning just to make sure we had all our blessings and uh, went full steam. And of course, like our vendors, we've done a lot of tweaking. <laughs> you know, every, it was great and suitable when we first turned it on, but every day something more came. And, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit about all the advancements that have come with coronavirus, our build, and, and how expanding the base team actually came up with even more ideas and now we have more capability and more things and bells and whistles and toys we could put in the system to help our clinicians. So Dwayne, I'll turn it over to you if you want to talk about your build. Thank you. And Cheryl, thank you for having us. We really do appreciate our, this opportunity. Um, so, you know, Steph's talked a little bit about the history and kind of how we came up with this idea. So I want to go from our conceptualization to our implementation. And so one of the biggest things that we had to do from, I, I did, I personally did most of the configuration. And so thinking about it from a programming slash configuration standpoint, you know, what I wanted to know what we could build once and reuse. And so that was big on my list because that's that ultimately would allow us to rapidly deploy whatever we needed. So one of the one of the first things we did is we sat down and we said, okay, here's the different disease processes we know, and we know you know virus X or the next one coming up. We know it may not follow the same guidelines or the or the same process. I mean, not guidelines, um, but we sat down. <clears throat> excuse me, we sat down and we said, okay, what are the commonalities here? What is unique for this one? What is unique for the next one? Such as Steph mentioned the sexual partner for Zika. You know, if they had, if the sex, if the, if the patient had not traveled, but the, that their sexual partner had traveled to one of the locations and we had to incorporate that. So that was kind of a one-off that we had to make the customization that Steph talked about a little bit earlier. We had to, we used the base model for that, but we had to add extra steps in there to, to account for that. Um, but overall, our biggest thing was build it once and reuse it. And so we are, we, we have actually, um, the power forms are all the same, except 
again, except for the sexual partner, they, they all follow, have you been exposed? This is patient reported, have you been exposed, yes or no? Um, and to what disease process? And the symptomology, your travel location and your travel time. So based on that, that's when we, we elected, and with the blessing of our governance committee, we elected to put an alert into the provider's face if they met this criteria. The, the one thing we are still working on is how can we catch them before the initial contact? Because with that data, you know, it has to be structured data in order for our alert to work. We, we don't have anything you know, how do we know they traveled? How do we know they're symptomatic? They're, you know, it's just hard to, hard to tell before at least somebody has an initial contact with them. So based on that, then we, we went down our algorithm and put in the, you know, put those data points into the alerts. And one big thing that the governance committee recommended is if they get one alert and, but they qualify for three of them, do not give them three alerts. Again, co helping to combat alert fatigue. So we put a prioritization on our alerts. Like basically we decided how deadly or how virulent or how contagious is it with Ebola, you know, being one of the most deadly ones that we have or that we've had at the time, that is that ranks the highest. So if they get an Ebola alert, they won't get any other alert. Um, coronavirus, we elected to put it in the second place. So if, if they meet the criteria for coronavirus, they won't get any of the other ones. And when I say the other ones, we've, we've created, we've, as Steph mentioned earlier, we've kind of, uh, this is our big bang, but we kind of tested this along the way with yellow fever, tuberculosis, the MERS alert measles alert. Um, we even had one for oh, our all travel alert. So basically, as you go down the prioritization list, if they've traveled and within the last two weeks and, or three weeks, I think it is, and nothing shows up, then or they don't qualify for anything, then it will hit what we call our all travel alert. And basically, when the alert pops up in the provider space, or the clinician's face, it says the patient has reported exposure to this, the patient reports this symptomology, the patient has traveled within this time frame, and the patient reports travel to these locations. And so it's 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 not expecting the provider to do anything with it or the clinician to do anything with it, only for awareness. If they elect to, we we put a we put a little hyperlink onto the alert where they can go to the orders page. So they can place orders at that time if they elect to, but we are, we're more interested in trying to keep our clinicians safe. And so we just wanted them to be thinking, you know, this person traveled, there might be something going on over here. This is, you know, just, just be aware of it. Um, the biggest maintenance we have right now is keeping up with the hotspots and the symptomology because that changes you know with coronavirus it started out as a travel it started out with basically a cough shortness of breath and a fever in which it that the symptomology is still that still there but the locations are pretty much irrelevant at this point and so that's one of the biggest maintenance is that we have to keep up with is just keeping your ear to the ground for whichever organization you're going to follow. Currently, we generally follow the CDC because that's most that's most uh, uh, that's what we rely on the most to uh, for for the United States, um, and they do a good job of keeping up with the world also. So that's that's the agency we elect to, to use most often. Um, so we pop that alert up in the provider's face, and if and if nothing or none of them qualify, it goes to the all travel alert. Uh, Steph talked a little bit about you know some of the enhancements that we're doing. We have we have recently looked at incorporating pulling maps like on the nursing documentation, of like a world map of where the hotspots are for certain disease processes. So we're looking at implementing a, it's called, 
I had, a, I had to have a colleague explain to me how to how to get this set up, but it's called an iframe, and we can actually we're we're investigating getting it onto the onto the nursing intake documentation, and it's it, it will be a static image when they pull up their documentation. It'll be a static image, but it will be real time up until when they pull it up because it'll be coming from a website. So as as up to date as that website is, that's what that's one thing we're looking at doing. We're also looking at another thing that we're looking at, and I'm sure somebody in the community would know, how, you know, would have some good ideas on this. But we're looking at, you know, creating orders within the, you know, from the alert to allow them to place an order right then, so they didn't, they won't, wouldn't have to go to the scratch pad in order to place the order. Um, that's going to take our governance committee deciding, you know, which orders need to go on which alerts, and um, and then from there, you know, if we can we can get that, that'll help reduce some of the alert. Well, not just alert fatigue, but maybe the documentation burden. You know, we can help try to help address that also. Um, that's. Uh, the from a from a back end perspective, I mean it all the structured data is what we need. We everything that we use uses Boolean logic, which you know if this if this if this is true, then you go to the next step. If that is true, you go to the next step and for and so on and so on and so on. Um, and as Steph said, we uh, we removed with the Ebola, we did remove the isolation cart. I did a quick run or a quick calculation on how much our isolation carts cost to re to restock and resupply, and we were, we got anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars savings just by removing that. Wow! So, <laughs> I mean, it was you know four hundred four hundred alerts and fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. We we thought that was a pretty good. It, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you know, that's not a whole lot of money, but that's you know, two people's salary or so. And okay. so every little so, bit helps. We, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well Steph, um, Steph so, mentioned something about like fire and your interoperability stuff and the hooks. Yes. So that is as Steph had mentioned earlier, we're on a couple of national committees that we're working on that. We would like to we would like to see fire come in to be more developed or be better developed. Um, it's currently there. I mean, the fire application, the fire API is nothing new. I mean, it's, or the APIs are nothing new. I mean, banks use it nowadays. You know, Apple, Apple uses it to get it from its Apple health into, into certain vendors. But what we'd like to see with the, with the fire and with the APIs is, you know, how can we leverage this for clinical decision support? So that's what the national committees are doing is setting up standard data sets or, uh, and they're, you know, how they're setting them up is creating artifacts. So if you have, they're working on, they worked on some with cardiovascular, they work, they're working on some with asthma. So, you know, Pretty much every time, like a child has asthma, for example, you're going to basically treat them the same, or they're going to have very similar signs and symptoms, some such like, such like, or such as we did with our um, infectious disease commonalities. You know, there's no reason we couldn't put that out there because these disease diseases have the same symptoms, the same travel requirements, the same travel time frame. Et cetera. There's no reason we couldn't put that out there. The, the challenge we're running into is, at a national level, is is getting it turned around quickly or as quick as quickly as we would like. Um, the other challenge is, you know, everybody agreeing on what those what those criteria would be. The next challenge I can see coming, and I don't know, I don't know from other other vendors or other folks that work with other vendors is defining or aliasing those value sets to come into your EHR. So for example, you know, is everybody going to, a CBC should be named a CBC across, 
but is everybody, you know, is it going to be named the same? Is somebody going to call it a complete blood count versus a CBC versus a CBC with diff, et cetera? And so you're really having to assign an alias at the national level and then everybody participate with that alias. You know, you can, you can call it whatever you want uh, internally, but then on the back end of wherever it goes out and retrieves that information, it's going to need to have some kind of code or alias, you know, Everybody needs to call it one, two, three, for example. And that way it would help. That would, we could go out and ping the, uh, ping the repository and pull it back in. Or we could even say, okay, once a day, pull in this information and it would live locally. So that's the other question, you know, do you push or do you pull um, to, to grab that information? And that way, Steph and myself and others like us would not be spending so much time with content creation, keeping up with the guidelines, because um, that honestly that is one of the most time intensive uh, exercises that we perform. Well, thank you for sharing. And that, that. really relates. Go ahead. I was just going to say thanks for sharing that. Go ahead, Steph. <laughs> Well, and what Dwayne said is very pertinent in how it relates to local practices as well, um, because what might be good for New York may not be as applicable for us in the West Texas area. There's a huge population difference, a huge exposure difference, and as evidenced by it just moving slowly in from the coast, we're, we're way later than what New York and California and Washington State have seen. And so local practices of what your physicians and nurses need and do in your local region always need to be considered with your clinical decision support as well. If it's something that's perhaps impacting a specific area of the nation, but it's really rare that it's ever going to come into your neck of the woods, then perhaps it's not as high a priority on the design list or the needs list. You even need an alert for it if it's really not going to impact your geographic region very much. But uh, to finish up what Dwayne was saying, uh, really the last part of this clinical decision support aspect is as good as we thought the rapid deployment model was before all this coronavirus really blew out the walls and i think it's just because it was yet again so different than what we've previously seen everyone pretty much thought to begin with oh it's another flu and flu kills everybody and it's a very high mortality rate and and this isn't as bad. And then of course, every day we hear something different, like now we have different weird symptomology, like perhaps GI inclusion. Um, you can't smell or taste, <laughs> you know, just weird things. And you're like, mm, well, it's not quite in the CDC guidelines yet, but do you want to include something like that in your screening tool? And then, of course, the big thing with screening tools we had to really start addressing is as crazy elaborate as our infectious disease intake is, if you're getting a surge and you are over inundated, are you going to ask your staff to fill out 14 required fields just to ask, you know, you do, do you even really need to ask travel at this point? It's, What's your symptoms and have you actually been exposed to a known person and what is our testing capability? Do we have enough tests to screen people for less and less qualifiers per CDC guidelines? And of course, that's where everyone got into trouble for under testing initially is because of the test availability. So all that has to be taken into consideration with your clinical decision support too. So because all the walls were kind of blown out our little design team of two is now 50, <laughs> which sometimes is good and sometimes bad because you got too many fingers in the pot now, but basically so many more other ideas and more clinicians with more points of view that can be taken and picked at and what can we put together to make the better, bigger picture. And so from that, we've, uh, we finally got our evidence-based order sets, which we didn't really have the opportunity to go with with Zika. They didn't really feel like it was a big enough patient load burden in the area to invest that kind of in time and, and manpower, manpower, person power into. 
now it is. And so, yes, they've got an inpatient and an outpatient version. Um, that's where they do have reintegrated a small amount of automation of isolation carts. They have them pre checked or pre-checked in their evidence-based order sets. So that helps out a lot with that. Um, whereas with Zika, they really didn't feel the urge to automate the orders. Now we do. So now we have automated orders. Um, sometimes more is more than you need. We've got several orders. We're always looking to how can we streamline that to be easier for the clinician? You know, do you want one stop shopping or do you want to have them have to think about it? Which one do I want to order? So all that's always being streamlined and looked at constantly here because we've had just a little bit of luxury that a lot of parts in the nation haven't had. We've got to watch it all happen somewhere else first. So a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about, we weren't talking, we're joking a little bit, but it's not a joke about Vanderbilt talking about converting a parking garage. And we were teaching a boot camp a couple of weeks ago and I go, no, really, <laughs> they're getting a parking garage ready with ventilators and, and isolation areas and stuff because they are, have the foresight to know this is gonna happen. And our health systems now there too, they're like, what, what are we doing? And so they're starting to look at other systems and that's where informatics is gonna get pulled into because you're gonna be building new locations every 30 seconds for where are we putting them now? Where are we gonna put them now? nurse documentation we're talking to them about we need to reduce the burden not just physician burden we got that covered we think nurse burden you know where are you going to start taking a little bit of the load off what is the minimum documentation required and i know vanderbilt put theirs out which was thanks guys <laughs> that was tremendously helpful for us to pass on to our executive leadership to consider and uh, what else a couple of extra alerts because we've had positive cases here now. So now we have inpatient alerts to let people know this is a COVID case. And we're trying to do things to make sure people aren't just playing in charts willy nilly. We're all under HIPAA and we know that's loosened a little bit, but not enough to just go play around wherever you want. So you have, still have to be mindful of those things. Eventually HIPAA is gonna go tighten its noose again <laughs> and we'll have to be, make sure that we stay within the ethics of our profession and of course the law. Um, integration of secure messaging has really come about a lot, um, especially we have automated notifications of our infection prevention and control. We had that with Zika, but they liked it enough that they said, make sure you keep us with this as well. So we were gl glad to hear <laughs> that they were really happy about that. And um, of course we had literally were just standing up our telemedicine before all this hit. So we've had a little bit of a lag with adoption. And I don't think it's, it's a little bit of usability. We're kind of more of a third party application than actually integrated into our EHR just yet. So there's a little usability issue. And interestingly enough, there's a money issue with the patients. There's funding reimbursements you have to think about. And if you have to pay 50 bucks for a telemedicine, but you can do 10 bucks for a copay or something, some people would rather go talk to you than view you over a television, which is bummer. <laughs> but actually it's starting to turn now. We're starting to actually make the, the leap into the telemedicine and it's starting to pick up a little bit. So that's fantastic. But we're it's very grateful that was stood up prior to this. <laughs> that came in very, very handy. And uh, I would say most of our documentation is still electronic. There was, um, like Vanderbilt said, uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say we've had one area that's gone to paper, but it's gonna be a high flow area. And that's kind of hard to argue with at some point until you get their true electronic documentation wheedled down to just the bare minimum. You know, they're gonna be like, oh, we only wanna document these 20 things and they're like, Okay, <laughs> so some of that's hard to argue with, but the rest of it's been pretty much electronic, which is commendable to our end users and especially with everything that's going on. And then nurse training and everything that's getting ready to go on with the uh, non-bedside nurses, <laughs> you know, like the, the two of us, you know, that kind of deal that's probably coming up in the future too. But again, we've been fortunate that we've been able to see the surge happen 
to those before us and, and try to learn as many lessons as we can and pay attention to pros and cons and see what we can do here to make it better. Yeah, I think one of the things that, that I keep hearing, we can't, we can no longer say it won't happen here. You know, we can't say, well, yeah, but we're not, we're not the big city. We're not the this, we're not the that. <laughs> you have to assume everything that has happened before can happen to you, will happen to you, and maybe something we don't even know about yet. So keeping that, that whole open mind, because it's so much easier just go, oh, no, not here, not, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Wish, wishful thinking doesn't really work too well in this. So anything else, anything else, I know, I know we were talking before we decided to, to start the actual recording, you know, your area, my area, we're both in Texas, you're on the west side, I'm on the east side, we're still at the, we're still pretty far away from our peak, you know, we're, we're just on that, that upward side, anything else that you want to share about what you're doing to get ready for that surge that you can think of right now? So, you know, like Steph was saying earlier, um, the hospital, we, they are, they've been collecting our data. Why the, uh, anyway, they've been collecting our data um, for the last two weeks, three weeks or so, you know, for the, for the, especially for the nurses that haven't been at the bedside or worse, nurses that work in a office type setting. Um, they've been collecting that data for a couple of weeks now, and we finally got the email yesterday afternoon or this morning that we're going to be going through training in the next two to three weeks Our, as you were as you were saying Cheryl your uh, you know your surge is coming up ours is expected to come towards the end of May maybe the first part of June um, is what our facility is predicting so we are getting ready as far as that goes Steph mentioned earlier you know about where you're going to house all these patients and that's what part of our department is doing also is building we're going to be building new locations at least virtual locations in the system so we can you know house these folks regardless of where they physically are you know they can at least have the the documentation and the chart and everything that they need as far as that goes um uh, some of the other things we're doing to get ready for it is they're trying of course like everybody they're trying to procure more PPE um, they're they're they put some recommendations out you know with some guidance on you know if you're transporting a patient that has COVID um, the transporting transporter staff is not allowed to do that since they would have to you know get a get dressed up in P, uh, PPE so to, in order to preserve that the nurse or the clinical staff that's taking care of that patient will escort them down to either radiology or you know surgery wherever they need to go it'll since they already have the PPE on they'll go ahead and take them down there and not use up not have an extra set of PPE be used by transportation um, and as far as just as far as spreading you know if if the patient if you have a patient that's in uh, respiratory arrest cardiac arrest they're leaving all the drugs and all the crash cart out in the hall and just getting them as they need it and so you know that'll help hopefully that'll help with the spread uh there we're much probably much like the rest of the country we're using n95 masks sparingly and reusing them you know the, uh, they have a set of two or three of them and they trade them out daily and you can know, only change them out if they truly get soiled so that's that's a couple of the things that we're doing um I would say, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You first. I would say only in addition to that <laughs> is things to look forward to in the future to consider that we've considered but haven't had the opportunity to really flesh out is uh, integration into your supply chain. Um, as Dwayne was talking about, you're talking about N95 mask. Um, we're already rationing. 
whether we have to or not yet, I'm not quite sure, but I'm sure if all the PPE is going to one like New York and stuff like that right now, we're probably sitting a little short over here at the moment. Uh, if you can get your data into the supply chain, that can maybe help be a little bit of predictive analytics. Like we really need to start looking now because in a week we're going to be bad. Uh, scrubs, we're already looking at, a, you know, allotment of that. And the facilities that we work with are being very generous with, you know, providing surgical scrubs to all the clinicians and bedside staff. But if those aren't taken care of, you know, we could run low on those as well. The nice part of it is that's kind of ironic nationwide is I've heard a lot of stuff lately about people in scrubs, whether they be nurses or not, being verbally or physically assaulted in public places because it's perceived that they are dirty or their scrubs are dirty or they're transmitting virus. It's nice a little bit education out that if you have facilities that are actually providing these staff with scrubs and that they're not allowed to take them home, <laughs> you have to leave them here so we can clean them for you tomorrow. Um, then be aware that there are facilities that are actually the, the nurse has to change and go home in their own clothes mm -hmm. because they're not allowed to, to have the uh, institution provided scrubs go home with them. Um, so uh, the only other thing I'd have to say is when we were talking a little bit about paper and the need for it, I mean, again, some cases you just can't argue, but of course we've already started talking about analytics and yeah. paper is not structured data. Mm -hmm. And even if you have like automated little text to where you can modify it in a message or something like that, that is also not structured data. So be aware that we understand, you know, if it's an emergency and you have to do what you have to do, that's good for today. But when you come in a couple of weeks and you're like, we need to start looking at data and it's not there, that's why. Mm -hmm. So just keep in mind that if you regress the paper for whatever reason, that that is not in the system. If you fill it out and you scan it in later, a scanned photo is worthless when it comes to trying to query data Yeah. much. So that's something to consider as well. Yeah. Well, I don't really have any more questions. I think we've covered pretty much everything. I really appreciate you. Everything. I, yeah. Everything we can cover in our time frame. Um, <laughs> but I really appreciate the focus on, on the clinical decision support. Um, that's not one we had talked about with anybody else. So I really, really appreciate y'all's experience with that and bringing that history forward because let's face it we need to not lose learning we need not to forget <laughs> the lessons that we've already learned and take them and the lessons we're learning right now we need not to lose them for the future yes let me <laughs> write it down yeah <laughs> well we're gonna we're at least gonna have some video documentation of it yay um so thank you both for spending some time with me this afternoon. I really do appreciate it. And I know the people that watch, watch these videos will, will be appreciative of it as well. Please take care, stay safe as you can. I will you all do the same <laughs> and we'll be talking with you soon. Thank you so I, much. Thank you. Be safe everybody. Thank you. Bye.